Welcome back to our study on the book of Isaiah. We are now in our third study, and we're still looking at introductory material. I'm just talking to John, and I'm a big believer in a lot of introductory material, uh, especially as it relates to a book such as Isaiah, because we have so many things that are dependent upon our understanding, our understanding the, the historical and the cultural impact of this book. Uh, I have long taught uh, that we cannot remove a book from its cultural and historical background if we're fully going to understand what that book has to say. And that is going to be key here. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'll give you a little bit of a preview. Uh, we may or may not be able to get into chapter one of our study. I would at least like to get into the first couple of verses. But when we look at a name for a people such as Israel, how we understand that really is based upon our understanding of that word being able to be used. We're looking now at three Hebrew terms that relate to the concept of a prophet. Some of them are going to refer to the man himself, and some are going to uh, refer basically to how the man receives the message and how that might portray what is seen regarding him. So first of all, let's look at the word Navi. Uh, it's transliterated N-A-B-I or Navi, but the V is often, B is often pronounced as a V. That is the term, the Hebrew term that is used the most often in the Old Testament to describe a prophet. The term is supposedly derived from another Hebrew word that means a fountain of spring water. And the idea there is used to bubble forth. Think about a, 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 a spring that is flowing or water coming up out of a spring and it's bubbling as it comes out. That bubbling is the idea that is used here for the term prophet. It came to mean to bubble forth or to pour forth. And so you've got the picture of God's word coming out, bubbling forth, springing forth out of the prophet as he speaks. And so the idea is that the, the prophet is one who pours forth the message that God had revealed to him or through inspiration. So the emphasis of this word is more upon foretelling than it is foretelling. Remember, we use those two words, I believe, in the last lesson. Forthtelling has to do with just speaking or preaching even. The word foretelling has to do with telling the future. Well, this word navi puts more emphasis upon simply the speaking or the telling of God's word by the prophet. The chief function of the prophet was to, to preach or to speak God's word that was received by inspiration to one's contemporaries. So you've got a man who is using God's inspired word, who has received God's inspired word, and he delivers that word to those who were of his day specifically, but they often have to do with telling the future the application being seen later. But even when you find the prophet speaking of a future event, such as Isaiah 53, he's speaking to his contemporaries about something or someone that's going to be spoken of in the future in that sense. The noun forms prophet and prophesy are used 325 times in 27 Old Testament books. Anytime we see something being spoken of that many times, there ought to be a red flag that goes up and, and, and saying, pay attention to me here. We need to understand the importance of that because of that frequency, because of that repetition. 325 times this word Navi is used. The verb form of the, book, of the, of the word is used 119 times in nine books. 
24 different biblical characters are referred to by that name, Navi. Well, then there's two other words that are used, and these are the words Hosek, or Chosek, and the word Roe. And that carries the idea of how they received the message. Oftentimes it's translated as seer, S-E-E-R, the one who sees a vision of that message. Those both deal with prophet and prophecy. E.J. Young presents an interesting insight into the words that we've discussed so far. Young says that the word Navi stresses the active work of the prophet in speaking forth the message from God. The word Roe, on the other hand, brings to the forefront the experience by which the prophet was able to see the message that he was to deliver. In other words, Navi is more about speaking the message or delivering the message but the word roe dealt more with how he received that message. He was able to see it. One word lays emphasis upon the prophet's relation to the people, speaking, preaching, teaching. The other word deals more with the relationship between the prophet and God. How did God provide the prophet with the message that he was to speak to the people? This is some of the distinction that's brought as we deal with these two words. Walter Kaiser, another noted scholar, said this, A Navi is one who is sent by God to announce his word. A Roe is one who is given insight into the past, present, and future. How does the prophet receive that insight? That's what the word roe is. How does the prophet know what to speak? How does he see the events down the road? Whoever the prophet is, he has a distinct task of either telling the message or telling the future, but he's one who has received that message from God in some fashion. A chose. Remember, that's the last two words that we're looking at, is one who was given this message in a vision. But not every prophet received the message in a vision. Some were. Now, if you will, turn with me over to 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 29. And if you're making notes, please jot this down. You might put it in the margin in your Bible there as, as, as above or near uh, the heading for the book of Isaiah, because 1 Chronicles 29, 29 uses all three of the words we've just referred to. The word Navi, the word Roe, the word Jose. All three of those are used here. Now the acts of King David, first and last, indeed they are written in the book of Samuel the seer, in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the book of Gad the seer. All three Hebrew terms that we've discussed for the last several minutes are used in that verse. One, two of the words are translated by one English word. That's the word seer. But those are the words roe and chose are translated, both translated seer in that passage. So to summarize, as we begin winding this down, a prophet was one who spoke for God. His message would concern the past and places. It would refer to the present, but it could also refer to the future. The prophet could speak all three. He clearly indicated that the revelation he received was from God. The prophet was one who never failed to let people know that the words that he was speaking were not his. He was God's spokesman. He was delivering God's message to the people. When we move through the book of Isaiah, this is going to be important because at times, Isaiah is going to be delivering a very uncomfortable message. 
as it relates to his people. Peter also clearly let us know that was the case. If you will, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. As you're turning there, this is a, a, a passage that we generally use as a support or to support the concept of biblical inspiration. We often focus on 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is a passage that is often used in the same way to indicate that the words that are recorded are not man's words. This is not the opinion of the one speaking or preaching. But one is simply a conduit through which God speaks to the people. Notice how Peter addressed this. 2 Peter 1, 19-21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Did this refer to some New Testament characters? Yes, indeed it did. But it did not refer only to the New Testament writers. The New Testament writers were inspired, as both Peter and Paul have revealed to us. But the Old Testament prophets were also men in a very special way and in a very major way. We find here that they did not speak of their own thoughts. This wasn't their opinion. This wasn't their conclusions. They were the vessels that God used to deliver his will to mankind. Now for a few minutes, let's look at some materials provided for us by Brother Jack P. Lewis. Brother Lewis was one of the scholars among us, a very educated man, and he had something to say about the functions of the prophets. And I want to just briefly go through these because I would like to get into uh, at least a portion of chapter one so that we can go ahead and get started on the text of this study. By the way, let me say this at this point because John and I were talking about this as well. There is not a doubt in my mind that before I get to the end of the study of Isaiah, we've got 66 books here. Before I get to the end of this study, we're going to have begun meeting again in the auditorium in the fashion that we're more used to. And I'm anticipating that day as much as any other. I'm very ready for that day when we can come together. It was great to see Brother Vince today, and it took great restraint not to give him a big old bear hug. That being the case, it is my plan when we come back together to in our Sunday morning Bible class resume the study that we were doing there on the fundamentals. But I'm not going to cut this study off. I will continue recording this study in the same format we're doing here, and I will make that available on Facebook to those who do want to continue this study through the book of Isaiah. I hope you will do so, because it is a very rich study. Okay, back to the study of the prophets and what their function was. Jack P. Lewis gave these five functions. Number one, they were champions of the religion of Yahweh in times of crisis. I love that he used the word Yahweh there because that's the word that is used for the covenant nature of God. In other words, God had his people and he was delivering a message through the prophet for his people. Number two, they were not primarily social or political reformers. Was there reform that occurred during the times they spoke? Yes, there were. But these men were divine spokesmen for the total situation. They weren't just reformers. They were the vessels that God used to deliver his will to man in a variety of ways, in a variety of situations. Number three, they were used by God to speak to men. Now, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 indicates that 
various times, various ways, God spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us through his son. Yes, the prophets were key, but there were also visions. But more often than not, God used the prophets to go to his people. So therefore, they were God's tools to go speak to men. Number four, they were not just wise men. They were inspired men. Wise men, when you look at wisdom literature, and that's the five books of poetry, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. A wise man there was one who was considered an expert. We've talked about this in our Bible class to some extent. This wise man was adept at doing various things. These men here are more than just adept. They're more than just experts in proclaiming a message. These men are proclaiming God's message. They're not just wise men. No, these were inspired men. And we need to remember that point. And then number five, they were the conscience of the nation of Israel. They're going to reflect a great many things that were problems during this time. Well, let's close out this section quickly. I'm going to give you some passages. We're not going to take the time to read them because I, I do at least want to get into a verse of Isaiah today. The inspired writers of the New Testament were fully aware of the continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not just the old book and the new book. It's not just the old book and the New Testament. Oftentimes I've heard people say, why do we need to study the old book? It's like, okay, we've got our New Testament now. The Old Testament is of no value. That is simply not the case. We see a great continuity between them. Yes, we have a division between Malachi and Matthew. That's just the way the books are put together. But if you'll remember in our scheme of redemption class, we indicated that the better way to divide the book was between Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Because the Old Testament relates that story, relates that account of how God chose to redeem fallen man. That goes throughout the old, right on into the new. So there is a continuity there, and the point that's being made here is that the New Testament writers recognized that continuity. Jesus bore this out himself in passages such as Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Luke chapter 18, verse 31, and Luke chapter 24, and verse 44. I come not to condemn the law, but to fulfill it. Yes, Jesus nailed the law to the cross as it relates to the system that directed men. But it still had a purpose. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Galatians bears that out. Well, the, the church and the apostles were aware that the redemption made possible through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ were all the fulfillment of prophecy. We're going to see some of those great prophecies. And yes, we're going to spend a great deal of time in chapter 53. But you'd also note Peter's words in Acts chapter 3, verses 18 through 24. That was his second sermon, if you will. And in that second sermon, he used powerful thoughts from the Old Testament to lay out the scenario that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. Well, Isaiah made a number of prophecies that were fulfilled in the life of Christ. These include predictions concerning his birth, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. Okay, that's it for the introduction. Let's spend a few minutes now going ahead and getting into the text. Here... If you have done so already, you should have a copy in front of you of the outline that we're going to be using from this point. 
as I indicated when I put when I made that outline available, I'm following that outline. That is the skeleton upon which I've hung the meat that I'm going to be using in this study. So from this point, you should be able to follow along fairly clearly and be able to, to keep up as we move. Sometimes we're going to be moving painfully slow because there are a lot of points that I'm really going to need to nail down. And then sometimes we're going to sail through some things that are just maybe more historical in nature. The intent of the study is going to be primarily to see the New Testament application but sometimes there's some historical things that we're going to need to move through. We may, we may move through some of those even more quickly. The first primary point of the book of Isaiah is found contained in the first 35 chapters of the book. This is the prophecies of condemnation. Chapters 1 through 12 are all prophecies against Judah. Now let's remember our time frame here. One more point, as we, and then we'll read a few verses. Remember that the ten northern tribes were carried away into Assyrian captivity about the year 722-721 B.C. Isaiah began his prophecy about the year 740 B.C., based upon the days of those kings that are mentioned here uh, in this first chapter of the book of Isaiah. It's only going to be about 20 years from the time that he begins. So here he's talking primarily about Judah. But Assyria is at the front door. Judah is going to be carried off into Babylonian captivity. And we're about to find out why as we look at these sections. Let's read verses 1 through 3 together first. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give, earth, or give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. There are those who do not like to study the prophets because they see a very dark message, and that is true to a degree. It's not a popular message. It's not a good message. Judah, excuse me, the ten northern tribes of Israel, God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to them to attempt to turn them back from the rejection that was seen in the form of idolatry. Yet through all of that, even though all these prophets were sent, they continued to reject God. They rebelled against God. And I want us to see a picture of, of a rebellious child here, because that's exactly what we see. We see somebody, we see a child bowing up to their father in resentment, in out and out disrespect and rebellion. You can't paint that in a pleasing way. I still cringe today when I see a child looked up at their parent that just told them to do something, and that child says, no, and the look on their face shows their rebellion and their rejection of what their parent had to say. Now picture all of God's people as doing that to him. All God wanted to do was to give them a place of favor. He wanted to love them. He wanted to care for them. He wanted to provide for them. And they were saying, no, we don't want that. We want these idols instead. I want to worship this rock that I carved a face into. I want to worship this tree that I cut and formed this God. I turn my back on the God of heaven, the creator, and I worship that which I created. That's what we see, and that's it's happening here. 
The recipient of the vision was Isaiah, the son of Amos. The nouns there, vision, and the verb saw, remember we said are derived from the same word before, the same root word. These words refer to truth that is disclosed by God, but not necessarily in a visual experience. Sometimes there could just be a voice that brought that message. They have special use with reference to the prophet's knowledge of divine matters that are revealed to them by God. E.J. Young declared that the word vision here referred to the supernatural nature of that revelation. In other words, he wasn't exactly saying there was a literal vision, but he used vision in the sense that whatever word Isaiah got, he got from God in a very in, in a supernatural way. Might it have been a vision? Yes. But the word vision is not necessarily uh, limited to meaning only that. So in essence here, we have a title to this book being the vision, as that's what's said there in verse 1. To do that, though, was rare among the prophets. As a matter of fact, the only two that use that phrase are Isaiah and Obadiah. And one of these days we'll get to a study of the minor prophets and see that more fully. The words concerning Judah and Jerusalem place the geographical focus of Isaiah's ministry to the southern tribes of Judah. That is the bulk of the book of Isaiah is going to be referring to Judah. It's almost too late for Israel. Those ten northern tribes, their fate has been sealed because of the number of times that they rejected God. I can't help but think of the words of Matthew 23, 37. And I use them often, but they're so telling here. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. God wanted to do that, and they said no. God said, here, I want to care for you. They said, we don't want that. That's how this has been characterized through all of this. As we saw in that introductory material, the chronological time frame was during the reigns of four kings, Isaiah, Jothan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. Therefore, that gives us the time frame of Isaiah's prophetic work being about 740 to about 686 B.C. Now, again, let's remember from the timeline that I gave you, 740 B.C., we've only got about 20 years till Babylonian captivity. When he closes out in 686 B.C., it's going to be another 80 years before we begin to see the captivity of these two southern tribes of Judah, Judah and Benjamin, as it relates to Babylonian captivity. So when the book of Isaiah is finished up, Israel is still at home. The temple is still there. They still uh, have life as they know it. But there's going to be turmoil coming. Within 80 years from the time of Isaiah, God's people are going to be carried away into a, to Babylonian captivity. Some of them will already be in Assyrian captivity. Their life is going to be upended. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were going to be carried off in that first wave, and their life was difficult, snatched up out of their homes and placed in indentured service in Babylon. You're going to see Ezekiel in a second wave carrying about 20,000 with him, and they're going to be in captivity. And then by 586, about 100 years after Isaiah closes, the temple's going to be in ruins. It's going to have been destroyed 
by the very people that God used to bring his people into bondage. That being said, next week, we'll begin there in verse 2. The next section is going to go through verse 15 of that chapter, and it's going to be the indictment of those two southern tribes. Thank you again for your interest. We had a little, couple of glitches here as it relates to the screen being frozen up. I hope that's not going to uh, interrupt the flow a great deal. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your interest in the study of God's Word. If you want to be reading ahead, that's going to be our next section is looking at a major chunk there of the first chapter. Uh, go ahead and read through chapter 1. We'll see how far we get from that point. Until then, thank you and God bless.